Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, one of our talks. Um, we have an author of a book, uh, Practitioner's Guide to Software Testing Design. Um, inside Google, we've been doing a, a book club where we've been reading this book for the last few weeks, and we're lucky enough to have the author here today, Lee Copeland, no relation to me. Um, he is also the, um, the program director for the STAR conferences. Uh, in addition, he is the managing uh, editor of uh, Software Quality Magazine, or Quality Software Magazine, I should correct. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite him up to uh, do a talk today on proving your worth. So give a round of applause to Lee Copeland. I'm not sure we're not related some way back in the... Um, yes, yeah, it's that intelligent uh, thing. Well, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be uh, invited to come and, uh, and chat with you. And uh, I'm going to talk today about proving our worth, uh, quantifying the value of testing. So let me find out a little bit first about who you are. Um, how many consider yourselves primarily testers? That's basically what you do. OK. Uh, how many do primarily do other things? What are some of those other things? Software engineering. Software engineering. Other things, please? Automation, okay. Other things? Manager. Manager of? Testing. Testing, okay. So, but you're all, you all have some interest and involvement uh, in, in testing, okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about that. Um, this, the idea for this talk kind of sprang from uh, an experience I had recently. I, I've got a, a new consulting client, we'll call them Megacorp, and uh, they invited me in to do an assessment of their testing process. This is one of the things that, that we do at the company I'm with, Software Quality Engineering. We come in and do assessments of people's testing process, and um, then if they, they want us to, we give suggestions on what they might do, uh, both in the short term and the long term, to, to make their process better, more effective. Um, so I, I went to Megacorp, and, and this is what I heard. First of all, I interviewed Raj and the project manager, and he said this. Uh, he said, testers are such a nuisance. They waste time, create bugs, get in the way of shipping our products, cost too much, and basically make the developers feel bad. And this was, this was his view. Um, I then went to talk to uh, Rayanne, who's the test manager, and she said this. She said, Management here just doesn't have a clue. They don't see any value in our, in our work. And, and why can't they make up our minds? One day, quality is the most important thing, and the next day, shipping the product is. <clears throat> so uh, as a consultant, you know, when you go in and you hear this kind of news, um, you do one of two things. You know it's either going to be a long process, or every once in a while, you're just going to want to tiptoe away as quickly as you can and, and go find another client. But I, I heard this, and, and I hear uh, in my consulting work, I hear these bombardments a lot. I hear these accusations flying, and, and, and perhaps you've heard them too. Hopefully not here, but you know that, that place you used to work, uh, you may have heard these kind of things. And, and like I say, I hope they're not flying overhead in your organization, but uh, uh, for some people I visit, we hear this thing all the time. Uh, there's the us versus them. You know, and, and us versus them often means good guys and bad guys. And, and depending on which group you're in, you know, you're either the good guy or the bad guy. Um, before we can talk about the value of testing, uh, I want to talk for just a second about what testing's all about. And uh, this is kind of interesting because I got an email just early this morning uh, from somebody over in, uh, in India who had read an article that I've written on uh, stickyminds.com, a shameless commercial message here. There's a website we uh, produce called stickyminds.com, which are trying to make the world's premier website on software testing and software engineering things. So uh, I wanted to suggest that to you. But the, the email was, I, I read your article, and, and you talked about testing use cases. And, uh, and I don't think you're talking about testing. I think you're talking about reviews and inspections. And so my response to him was essentially to, to do a copy and paste right from this presentation. What do we mean by testing? Well, there are different definitions. Uh, 
uh, Glenford Myers, who, who wrote one of the first books on software testing techniques, I think it was 1978 or 79, said this. He said, testing is the process of executing a program or system with the intent of finding errors. That's what testing is, no more, no less. Um, <clears throat> Bill Hetzel, who is another one of the grandfathers of formal testing in his book, uh, which was first published in uh, 1983, said this, testing is any activity aimed at evaluating an attribute of a process or a system. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, do you, do, do you uh, feel a difference between really these? What's, what's the difference here? What's the major actually. difference? This is the audience participation part of the program here. <laughs> Right, the first one is all about executing test cases, isn't it? Um, what about things like reviews, inspections, walkthroughs, buddy checks? They, does that fit in the first definition? No. Does it fit in the second definition, though? Yes, it does. Now, in, in fact, there is even a narrower definition. There's a fellow named uh, Robert Binder who's written a book. It's Testing Object Oriented something, either software or systems. I think it's Testing Object Oriented Systems. Uh, if you've ever seen this book, you'll never forget it. it it's over 1,400 pages long. You can physically hurt yourself by picking this book up wrong. Um, I, I wrote a book review of it some years ago, and I actually took it down to the grocery store and weighed it, you know, in the produce section. It, uh, it weighs about four and a half pounds, which turns out to be twice the birth weight of my, my last child. <laughs> he was about 2.2 when he was born. So it's a big book. But Binder says this, he says, testing is running the test cases. You ask Bob, you say, well, what about designing the test cases? What about planning for testing? What about evaluating, you know, the, the expected result versus the actual results? He says, no, 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 that's not testing. Testing is just running the test cases. I don't know about you, that, that strikes me as a little narrow for a definition. But one of the difficulties that many organizations have is we as testers don't even know, we can't even agree on what the word testing means. So I would suggest that an important prerequisite for figuring out the value of testing in an organization is first of all, figure out what you're talking about. What does testing mean? Now, there's another book, again, I wanna shamelessly plug here because it's a companion book to mine. It's called Systematic Software Testing, but written by Rick Craig, who's a, a one of our, our company consultants and trainers. Uh, Rick and Steve wrote this. They said, testing is a concurrent life cycle process of engineering, using, and maintaining testware in order to measure and improve the quality of the software being tested. So again, this is a broader definition. And I like the idea here of improving. Testing without improving is an interesting task, and yes, you can get paid for that, but Ultimately, if we don't improve the product, I, I don't feel much use for, for doing that. So there, there are all kinds of definitions of testing. I happen to like this one the best. Now, note the similarities in these, though. The process of finding, the process of evaluating, the process of measuring, the process of improving. What's the big word in every one of those? That's the process that we do. And I think for over a quarter of a century now, we as testers have focused on the wrong thing. We have focused so much on the internal processes, how we do testing, how, well, how do you put together a test plan? How do you design test cases? Um, how, do you, how do you execute those? How do you automate some of that stuff? That we have generally ignored the real purpose of testing. We have focused so much internally, we focus so much inward, and, and, and our reputation kind of goes along with that. I mean, what kind of things do we report to our, to our project manager, to our program manager, to executive managers? We tell them about the process. We say things like, we created this many test cases today, and we executed them, and we found these many defects, and, and they don't care, because we're telling them about the innards of our process. There's something else we ought to focus on. I think the real purpose is, purpose is this, and here's a drum roll. Yeah, you're gonna have a drum roll. Googled around last night for all kinds of, you know, drum roll MP3s and just couldn't find the one that I wanted. So we're gonna leave it at this, this drum roll. 
Um, the purpose of testing is actually to create information. Let me say that again. The purpose of, of testing is to create information. And, and James Bach wrote this a, a number of years ago. He said, the ultimate reason testers exist is to provide information that others on the project can use to create things of value. Those of you who, who work daily as testers, have you thought about your role in this way? Or have you thought about your role as my job is to write test cases, my job is to run test cases, my job is to report on? I think uh, those are all good. I mean, those are all wonderful. Well, of course we have to do that. But I think there's a higher level view, and that what we're doing here is we're trying to create information that will be of value that other people then can use to create products that are of value to our clients. So that's kind of the big message for today. So let's go back to Raj and the project manager here. When he says testers are such a nuisance, maybe what he's really trying to tell me is something else. Maybe he doesn't know how to articulate it very well. Maybe he doesn't understand the exact words, but maybe he's trying to say this. I'm not getting enough valuable information to justify the cost of testing. Does that make sense? Can you understand that when somebody says this, what they really might be trying to say is this. I just don't get any value of this. There's all this activity going on. There's all this expense. There's all these people. There's all this stuff. And yet I don't, I don't receive anything. Or my product, my project, doesn't seem to receive anything of value from that. Maybe that's what he's really trying to tell us. Okay? And again, he, he, you know, he just doesn't know how. Now, let's go back to Rayanne, the test manager. When she's saying this, maybe what she's really trying to say is this. My management doesn't value the information I'm providing to them. Again, do you, do you see how when she says these kind of things, she might be trying to say this. Uh, human beings are, are just notoriously good at providing alternate meanings to words. You know, somebody says something and we, we apply some, let me give you an example. Um, this, this last spring I put up a fence around my house so finally I can let the kids and the dog kind of roam freely. But before that, my wife would ask me a question. She would say, where are the children? That's a simple question, right? Where are the children? And if I didn't know, I would go, oh, no, I'm a bad parent. I don't know where my children are. I'm neglectful. I shouldn't be that way. And then that would quickly turn to, but my wife already knows that. Why is she bringing this up? Why is she accusing me of being a bad parent? And, and this, this happens in, you know, in microseconds. We go from her question to, I am a bad parent, and my wife is letting me know that. Now, one day, I got tired of this, and I said to her, why do you constantly attack me? And she said, what? I said, you're always after me about. She said, <clears throat> I ask you, what are the x, y coordinates of the children? That's all I was asking. That's all I wanted to know. And I was adding all this stuff to it. There are often messages that we add to words. And there are some times when we just flat out, you know, we don't get the message that's in the words. You know, my daughter is trying to dump the latest boyfriend. And words like, I never want to see you again. Do not call me again. Seem to just, you know. So this is a problem at all all human communication has. We, we, we miss some stuff and we add some other stuff to it. But, but perhaps these are what these folks are really trying to say. So, again, I think the value of testing is the value of the information that we create for others. Now, who determines that value? Again, this is the audience participation part. Who determines the value of that information that we provide to them, whoever them is? Say again? The, re the recipient, absolutely. It would be a lot easier if we, if we determine the value. Then there is great value to all those reports you know, that I send out on a daily and weekly basis.
But in fact, it's the recipient, it's the hearer, it's the, it's the receiver who determines the value. Now, as I was doing some research on this talk, I, I, found across, I came across a paper written by this fellow, uh, Cameron Parse, who, uh, who had a really cool idea. He said, we should set up information experiments. We should give certain managers certain kinds of information and withhold that information from other managers. And then we should vary those kinds of things like you would in a scientific experiment and figure out which information is really useful and which isn't. Now that's great. Um, I hear these kinds of, of proposals all the time for these kinds of experiments. The amazing thing to me is that the first name of every person who ever proposes these things is always the same. The, the people who propose these things is, are, always have the same first name. Their first name is Professor. Okay. Would you do this in your organization? Would, would you specifically withhold information from your manager? Would you specifically withhold information from your team as an experiment to see how well or how poorly they perform based on that? So that's why I say in the utopian world, you know, we might do this. But I, I just don't think it makes any sense. What we need to do is give everyone as much valuable information as we can. I have a, a good friend over in, uh, in the UK named Lloyd Roden, who's a, a testing professional there. And, and I asked Lloyd to take a look at my presentation, and he came back with this criticism. He said, wait a minute. Yeah, I like what you say, but doesn't testing have a value in and of itself, even if we don't create any information? If we find a defect, and we find that early, and it gets fixed, and it never then escapes into production, haven't we added value? I mean, we save the organization some money, right? Because we don't have to find it and fix it and deal with it later. And, and, and I agree that, yes, we have created value. But I want to focus on this other thing. Because I think most organizations, at least the ones that I've seen, have no mechanism for quantifying the value that testing adds. What we have are what we call campfire stories. You go to testing camp in the summer, yeah, I go up, sit around the, the, in the mountains, and you know the moon's coming up, and you got the campfire, and you're singing kumbaya, and you're telling testing stories. This is what I mean by camp. You, you, you don't go to testing. Okay, well, missing out a great deal. Do you go to the star conference? <laughs> okay. Um, by campfire stories, I mean stories, anecdotes that we tell. And, and many organizations have what I call campfire stories. Oh, you remember the bug when it was this, if it was the second Tuesday of the month and the moon was full and the amount was this and the, you know, this didn't match that and dot, 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 then the system failed. We, we, we love to sit around the campfire and talk about those stories. In fact, if you were the, the solver of that, if you were the discoverer of that, you know, you, you get to tell the story and everybody smiles at you at the campfires. The campfire stories make it at the executive level in organizations. Very rarely. They like data. Especially they like economic data. You know, cost and profit and return on investment, things like that. That's, that's the language. So, so I will admit that there's a value simply to finding defects, even if we created no information. But again, most, most organizations wouldn't even have a clue as to how to quantify that. Now, who are the clients then? If we're testers, who are the, who are the possible clients for the information that we have? And uh, you know, here's a big list, and I'm, I'm not claiming this is a complete list at all. But I, I want to pick two or three off this list, and we'll talk about those. Before we do that, though, I want to introduce you to something called the GQM model. How many of you have heard of GQM? Raise your hands, would you? Okay, just a couple. It's a very simple model of metrics. Um, and it, it's just, it, it's so profound to me, but it's also obvious. I, I, you know, I just wonder why I never thought of it. But uh, a, a guy named uh, Victor Basili, uh, Vic is a, a professor of computer science, I think, at the University of Maryland. And, and Basili came up with this GQM model some years ago, and, and I find it very, very useful in any kind of measurement situation. G simply stands for goal, 
Q is for question and M is for metric. And what Basili suggests is that before we start gathering information, before we start publishing information, and again, we're talking about information that we as testers would create for our clients, whether those are developers, development managers, project managers, whatever. That we first ask, what is our goal? What is it that we're trying to achieve? We might, maybe our goal is a zero defect to software. Um, maybe our goal is uh, uh, fewer than, than so many dollars or so many percent rework costs. Maybe our goal is less than a certain percentage of, uh, of su ongoing support costs. There may be all kinds of quality goals in an organization. So the first thing we do is ask, what, are, what is our main goal or what are the goals that we're interested in reporting about? The second part then is Q. What questions would you have to be able to answer in order to know that you were meeting those goals? Well, if, if my quality goal were zero defects, then what would a question be that I would be interested in having the answer to? How many defects? Sure, sure. This is not really rocket science. Here. Okay? And then, and only then, do we go out and measure something. But we start with G, and then we ask about Q, and then finally we get to M. Now we go out and measure things. Why do we measure things to help us answer those questions? Why do we have those questions? Because we're trying to understand if we're achieving that goal or not. What would you guess most organizations do when they put together a metrics program? What would you guess that most testers do when they start reporting you know, measurements to their clients? Where do they typically start in GQM? What would you guess? M, absolutely. They just scamper around and say, well, what can we measure? Oh, we could measure this, we can measure this, we can measure this. They measure all kinds of stuff. And then comes that fateful day when they have to figure out what it means. And often they can't. Uh, many years ago, I was doing some consulting, visited an organization, and uh, they, they showed me their metric stuff. They had measured all kinds of things, and they had this giant uh, color uh, graphics monitor. Now, this was long before color monitors existed, and it was huge, and it must have cost thousands of dollars. But they displayed their numbers and they were in different colors and they could rotate and scale and it was, you know, I've been in this business a long time. Not many things impress me anymore, but this knocked my socks off. This was really cool stuff. And then I said, now what have you learned from this data? And there was this long pause and they said, maybe we should rotate the data for you again. <laughs> And they did, and then I asked another question. I said, now what about your process have you actually changed because of what you learned from this data? At which point they rotated it again for me, faster this time. Um, they had gathered you know, gigabytes of data and they had no clue what it meant. Now I will admit that there are certain times when this is a legitimate approach. If you go back to the history of, of, of the early history of, of Western medicine, people like Galen and Hippocrates and so on, these guys thousands of years ago, uh, they measured all kinds of things. They measured pulse rate, respiration rate, temperature, phlegm level, bile level, and all kinds of other things. Now some of those we now know are useful. I mean, if you go to the doctor these days, no matter what your complaint is, what's the first thing they do? Blood pressure, respiration rate, heart rate, stuff like that, right? It's just because they're so useful in terms of metrics. We also know that there's a lot of stuff that the, the ancient Greeks used to measure. It's just bogus. It doesn't mean anything at all. So I would admit that early in exploration, it might make sense to, to measure a lot of stuff simply because you don't know what to measure. If you remember back in those days, it was, it was actually illegal, you know, punishable by death to open up a human body, to see what went on inside. And so they're just, they're making this stuff up. You know, they're doing the best they can, but they're, they're just kind of making stuff up. Many organizations that I visit with, both the development side and the testing side, they don't know how their mechanisms work inside either. They don't know what their processes are. You know, requirements go in and code comes out and nobody's quite sure, you know, and, and so nobody knows what to measure. 
where code comes in and some kind of testing process is done and tested code comes out. And again, because nobody knows what's going on inside that process, inside that body, nobody quite knows what to measure. It's okay in an experimental way, but generally GQM makes a lot more sense. Now, sometimes you go to a client and you say, you know, I'm a, I'm a tester or I'm, I'm the manager of a test group and say you're the project manager and, and I want to report to you, I want to let you know of our progress, I want to let you know of our value. What kind of information would you like to have? And, and what kind of answer might you get? I can think of kind of two basic answers. What kind of answers might you get from that question? Well, what kind of information would you find valuable? Okay, number one is the answer you're giving me right now. I don't have a clue. I don't know. And the other answer I hear a lot is, oh, uh, whatever you did last time. Years ago, I, I ran a, a big iron mainframe data center. And uh, in those days, we used to get all our paper from trees in the Mojave Forest. And, and we're just using, well, it's a forest then. Uh, we're just printing out you know, boxes of paper every minute. And I said, I, I just know this stuff's not being used. So I sent out a questionnaire. Do you really need all these reports? And guess what answer came back from everybody? Yes. Now I knew that was baloney. Uh, but I, I didn't have a better way of, of measuring that. So what I did one day was we just turned off all the reports. This didn't send out any reports and waited for the phone to ring. Somebody would call up and say, hey, I didn't get my D report today. Oh, well, we'll look into that. And we turned them back on. And we reduced you know, paper consumption by 80% for internal reports by, by that trick. Sometimes people just can't give you a good answer. There's a trick that I often use as a consultant, and that is I, I have, in fact, I didn't bring it with me, but I have a magic wand. <laughs> I bought it last time I was at Disney World. It's got a wand, a little star, and it's got little pink streamers. It's really kind of cute. And, and I carry it around in my bag with me on consulting assignments, and I give them the magic wand. And I say, you can wave this magic wand in any way you want. It's magic. Now that you have this magic wand, how would you wave it? What would you, what would you like to have? Okay. I sometimes tell them that testing is a magical information machine. It can give you all kinds of information about the product, the quality of the product. If you had such an information machine, what would you ask it? What kind of information would you want? I've always been amazed over the years that these two tricks, giving somebody a magic wand or giving them the magic information machine, gets them unstuck. People who five minutes before didn't have a clue what they wanted, you give them this magic wand, they're somehow now empowered you know, to think, oh, well, if I had a magic wand, I'd be interested in these kinds of things. So it's, it's, a, it's a trick that, uh, that I use, and you can use it too. OK. Now, in using GQM, we can do that to, to understand um, the kind of information that would be valuable to our clients as, from a testing standpoint. I, I think there are also some attributes of, of valuable data, uh, irrespective of, of what we're doing, what kind of things we're measuring. You know, I just want to share some of these with you. What would be valuable for almost all information? Again, you know, you guys have this wonderful search project or product. So I, I went to my Google toolbar and I typed uh, Lookout Titanic. And I found this picture. OK, here's a, a lookout from the Titanic. And I would suggest the first attribute of any kind of valuable information is that it must be accurate. Does that, that make sense? that feel right? So when the lookout says, there are no icebergs in the vicinity, Captain, that's just not accurate data. OK? Good data, useful data, useful information is timely. It's preemptive in the sense that we can use it. For example, when the lookout said, as the ship is sinking, ah, oh, captain, there are icebergs in the vicinity. OK, now is it accurate? Absolutely accurate, but it's a little late, right? A little late. Now, 
Good data, good information is also complete. Okay, and so when the lookout says there are no icebergs on the port side, Captain, again, accurate? Sure. Timely? Could be. Okay, where was the boat or the ship actually hit? Starboard side, on the right side. Okay? So it's got to be complete information. These three make sense? How about these? Uh, good information is also relevant. So when the lookout says, oh, Captain, look at the northern lights. Aren't they beautiful tonight? Accurate? Timely? Okay. Not particularly relevant, though, to the task at hand. Now, good information is also unique. And by unique, I mean it's just it's not available from other sources. It's not something just everybody would know. For example, when the lookout says, it's cold out here tonight, Captain, the captain already knows that. Oh, it's accurate and it's timely and it's all those other things, but you know, it's not particularly unique. Everybody knows that. And the final attribute of good information, it has to be actionable. That is, you've got to be able to do something with it. Because we know this information, now we're going to do something. We're going to change our process, or we're going to do more of this, or less than that, or something. It's got to be actionable. So when the lookout says, Captain, icebergs on the starboard side coming at us fast, that's actionable. It's accurate, it's timely, it's complete, it's actionable. You can, you can take some action. Okay, so this is the value of information. Most clients that I visit with, when testers report information, whether that's to their test manager or to a project manager or some executive management, they give things like stuff on the left here. How many test cases have we planned? How many did we actually write? How many have we executed? Of those, how many have passed? How many have failed? How many are blocked for some reason? We, we can't continue with them. We often talk about, well, we found 83 severity one defects and 42 severity two defects and so on. Um, one of my favorite metrics is something called uh, DDP. DDP is defect detection percentage. It's simply the percentage of what percent of the defects did we find inside, in-house, versus what percent escaped out into the field to our customers. And of course, you would like you know, probably 90, 95, 99% of defects to be found inside, and only a very few, uh, hopefully none, but probably a few will escape to the customer. And there, there are all kinds of other TLAs. Do you know TLAs? Three-letter acronyms? Uh, branch coverage, statement coverage. Uh, you read about that in my book. Uh, these are the kind of things we typically report. If I were a test manager and I had been a tester a week ago, I might be interested in these kind of things. But the higher up you go in an organization, what kind of information do they really care about? What would they find valuable? What would be useful? What would be timely? What would be accurate? What would be actionable? Money. Money's a big one, isn't it? Uh, I often tell people in my classes, I, I ask this question, I said, what's the primary language that managers speak? I, 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 usually, I usually kind of fool it by saying, well, you know, how many of you speak more than three languages or more than two languages? I, and then I, uh, I ask, and, and what's the primary language that managers speak? And it's money, right? They're interested in things like, because of these defects, what would, be, what would happen in terms of loss of sales? or loss of revenue, or market share. The, uh, the classic example, and I'm just, I'm looking here, I'm, I'm older than everybody here in the audience, and I'm probably older than some of you put together. Um, but years ago, there's this little uh, software company called Ashton Tate. Anybody remember Ashton Tate? A little product called DBase. Uh, DBase is a marvel. It's, uh, it's equivalent to Microsoft's, what? Yeah, Access. Uh, and, uh, and they had 80% of the market share. And then DBase 4 came out. It was the first Windows version. And it was terrible. People fled. They didn't just leave that product. They fled that product. Um, they went from 80% market share to 20% market share in six months. Ashton Tate just is no more. Their, their bones are bleaching out in the desert somewhere. 
Okay? These are things that, that our management cares about. Loss of sales, loss of revenue, loss of business, reputation, those kind of things. How about claims for compensation? Because your program screwed up, it cost my company a lot of money, and I already have these lawyers on staff, and so we're going we're gonna to sue you. We want money back for the, the, the pain that you caused us. Okay? Then there's the cost of what I call restorative actions. That's, you know, that's getting it fixed and getting the next version out there and all those kinds of things. Okay? Um, these are the kinds of, of, this is the kind of information that's far more interesting than the kind of things that, te that testers typically create. Okay. Now, the last couple of minutes here, what I'd like to do is, uh, is we're going to kind of listen through the wall here. Um, can't see it very well. I think they actually both have glasses, you know, and they're kind of listening to see. And they're, they're going to listen in on the developer. Um, the developer's thinking this. My goal is to get my code out on time without making any real blunders in it. I don't want the customer finding them. Then I look foolish in front of the whole team, especially my manager. Now, if you were to go talk to the developer, they might flower this up or sweeten this up, but you know, that's really what's going on in their head. And so you might say, well, what would the developer be interested in, in knowing that we as testers could supply? What kind of information could we give them that might be valuable? And I've just, I've just listed a few here. A, a, a developer might be interested in, well, how many defects have I created? Okay. I might like to know more about these defects. Are they just are they scattered randomly throughout the, the code that I wrote? Are they focused in one place? Are they just, you know, sometimes you have a bad hair day, and then sometimes you have a bad programming day. You just, you know, you just don't get it quite right. Uh, are they that or are there patterns? Am I making the same mistake over and over and over again? Patterns refer to things that, while each one appears differently on the surface, underneath it's really the same problem. It just occurs, it comes in different disguises. Okay, so these are the kind of things that a, a developer might find useful. And so what value would they attach to this information? Well, again, I'm, I'm just listening in on the developer's mind here. It says, well, quantifying the value of this information is difficult. Hmm, if, if, it, uh, if I made fewer mistakes, if it cost X dollars to find and fix each one of my mistakes, and I made Y fewer mistakes based on the information that my testers are giving me, I've saved the company X, Y dollars. But you know, right now I don't know what X is, and I don't know what Y is, and so I, I, and I don't know how to find out. So here's a, here's a person or a, a group that might really v value certain kinds of information that we could give to them. Okay. And they wouldn't say things like, you're creating bugs, or you're wasting my time, or you're making me feel bad. They'd say, thank you for that information. OK, how about a test manager? Well, again, we're listening in on the test manager. He says, my goal is to ensure that my testers find most of the defects, very few escape into production. So what questions might this uh, test manager have? Well, what percentage are actually being found during system testing? What percent are being found before system testing? What actually escapes out into the field? As a test manager, I might be interested in what techniques are effective in finding bugs and what techniques are not particularly effective. Okay. If all I know are there's these three techniques and yet they're not very good, maybe I should go learn some more techniques. Another thing I'd be interested in if I were the test managers, the ones that did escape to the field, how did they sneak past us? What was it about our testing process that allowed those guys to sneak out the door? Another way to say that is, where are the holes in our testing net? If you think about testing as, you know, we got all these fish, you know, the bugs, and we're throwing the big net out and trying to catch as many. Where are the holes in the net? And what kind of things allow escape? And then the value that the test manager would have is, is this. You'd say, well, the percentage of defects we find during testing is very high compared to those that escaped in a production. It makes me look good. Well, let me see how this is going to play out. <coughs> My management won't see any real value in this information. In fact, they'll probably use it against me. They'll quickly forget how many defects we're finding, 
and focus just on the ones we missed. And they'll say things like, well, that was a very critical defect. How'd you miss that one? I don't know. Again, I know this never happens here, but that place you used to work, have you had that experience? It doesn't matter how many defects you find. It's the ones that you missed, you know, that are ones that are then remembered, okay? And then and statements like this, and, and these are direct quotes from some of my other clients. Uh, it's apparent your team can only find the unimportant bugs. Our novice users find the real ones. And so finally, the test manager says, you know, maybe I'd be better off just not reporting this information. I'm doing some consulting with a, an insurance company right now. Uh, I did some interviews the other day, and we were talking about bug reporting, and do you have a defect tracking system, and do you report everything? And they said, oh, yeah, we report everything, except some of the really big bugs we don't actually put into the defect tracking system. We just put them on sticky notes on the wall. I said, why is that? They said, well, that way management won't find out about them and, and won't think we're doing a bad job. This from the development side. And then from the tester side, it was, and if we don't report them, then if we don't find them, then they don't count against us. Okay? So, you know, whenever you're a recipient of information, you might think about, you know, how could I misuse this information? If you're the producer of information, you might want to think about how could this information be misused? Not that anybody here would do that, but, you know, it might happen someplace. Okay, one more. We got the project manager here who says, my goals are high quality product. It gives our customers good experience while solving their problems and it doesn't create major post-release support problems for me. Okay, so what would, what would the project manager be interested in? Well, how many defects have I found so far? What would the impact have been on the organization had those gotten out to the field? See, that's the value of testing, isn't it? For every defect that we find and prevent from going out, we have... Uh, like my friend Lloyd says, we have saved the company some money. Okay? But the real question I'd like to know is how many more serious defects are in there that we haven't found yet? This has to do with mind reading and looking into crystal balls and those kinds of things. And, and, and then trying to guess how many and where they might be and what the impact would be. So the value, well, if I could add up the dollar impact of each of these defects and then subtract the cost of finding them, that would be the value of the information that testing created. And I can then go to my executive management and say, see this testing thing is valuable, it's worthwhile. I put this amount of money in and I save this amount and it's a much bigger number. So this is how the project manager would see things. Well, these are just three scenarios that I've picked to illustrate how the, what the value of testing might be. Again, as a tester, if you continue to focus on reporting the classical things, number of test cases designed, number executed, number of defects found, all that kind of stuff, again, you're doing a good service, but you're not providing the kind of information that most of your clients would see as, as valuable. And so that's what I wanted to suggest. And, and if you're not providing valuable information, I, I think you can just expect the, the bombardment to continue here. People will continue to say, well, testing is, isn't a value. You know, it gets in the way. It slows us down. Those testers create bugs. Now, all of those strange statements are actual quotations from people that I've met with. I've had people tell me, I've had development managers tell me, there wouldn't be any bugs if it weren't for testers. <laughs> you know, and you just kind of shake your head and look around and go, oh, yeah, okay. All right. Well, this is the, uh, the end of my presentation. Again, a couple of shameless commercial messages here. Um, again, our company, Software Quality Engineering, runs a couple of conferences every year called Star East and Star West, which are focused just on testing. Um, we'll have 1,000 people come. We had 1,000 people at Star East in May in Orlando. We'll have 1,000 at, uh, at the Disneyland Hotel in October. Uh, you're going to be there? OK. Uh, Harry's there to do a thing on uh, model-based testing. Um, somebody once said uh, the STAR conferences are the semi-annual staff meeting of the world's greatest testers. And uh, you know, would invite you to, uh, to participate in that, you could. Um, I don't know how much time we have because I turned off my clock. Any questions, comments? Uh, please. <laughs> Got over. It's really good for evaluating something that's already existing. How do you 
town with something that you want to put in place for budgeting reasons? Um, why don't you put this in place for budgeting? Oh, um, this is, this is uh, so your question, let me understand. Your question is, this is a good scheme if you already have something, you know, you have a project or a product or something, but what if, what if it's a brand new product? What if you're trying to budget? And how would you use this? Is that your? Not the product, but the testing process. The testing process. You know, that's a really tough one. Uh, estimating is one of the more difficult things that we do. Um, I, I think in the, in the time that we have, all I could give you is this old axiom that says, the future is a lot like the past, only longer. And, and so what I would do is simply look at past performance and past history. And you know, if, if this new thing is about this big and we had things that were about that big in the past, you know, just, just go back to your experience. Uh, the downside of that is that many organizations don't have any documented experience. You know, they never sit down and keep track of and write down this stuff. So when a new thing comes along, they're trying to say, well, you know, uh, how, how expensive or how big or how many people hours or whatever. They, they just don't have a database to fall back on. Uh, that's about as, as you know, detailed an answer as I could give you in, in this time frame. But it's just, you know, look at your past experience. Um, like I say, most organizations don't, don't even maintain that kind of data. So, you know, it's this kind of thing. Question? So what do you do when the development manager says, I'd like you to show me that information on what bugs each of my developers is doing, how many, and what, what the issues are? So I'd like to use that to rank them. OK, uh, good question. Any, did everybody hear the question? So when the development manager says, now that you have all this wonderful defect data, and you're sharing all this with me, I'd like you to sort it into little buckets by programmer. And I want to see how many defects each programmer creates and of what kind they are so that I can use them for, now let's make a list. So that I could use them for uh, um, skill improvement. Does that sound like a good idea? I mean, if, if certain developers making the same kind of mistakes over and over and over again, it's probably a skill issue, okay? Um, how about so that I can uh, rank order them? It's kind of iffy. How about so that I can, you know, um, demote, fire them? Um, you know, I, I, I can't give you a one-size-fits-all answer. To me, it depends on who that development manager would be and what I think they're going to use that information for. Let me ask you this. If, you give, if I give you a really hard programming problem, and in, and in this, this module that you're working on, which is really difficult, nobody in the world's ever done it before, you, make, you create 10 defects. And I give you a very simple programming task to do. And in your module, you create five defects. Who is the, the better programmer? Who's the worse programmer? See, the numbers don't make any, any sense without a context, do they? You might say 10. That's fantastic. Why, well, I figured it'd be you know, two, three times that many, because what you're working on is so complicated. You made five, oh, that's terrible. OK? So the, the raw numbers themselves rarely tell us anything. They, they all have to be taken into context. And personally, uh, and this is just my personal you know, style, I, I would try and understand what use the person was going to make of that, and if they were going to use that, that data you know, essentially in a righteous manner, you know, in a, in a useful manner, uh, or if they were going to use it in a, in a punitive manner that just didn't make any sense to me. Um, so that's, but again, it's a classic it depends answer that consultants always give. We go to consultant school to learn how to say that. Yes? And again, uh, I was thinking, would, yes. uh, would not the developers use a project plan to constantly upgrade uh, any information that an industry gives so that they send the developers into the product or the project or more to I think wise developers would be interested in those kind of things. His question is, wouldn't a developer be interested in that kind of information? Is that, and, 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 and want to have a history and, and want to then use that personally in, in terms of, I would think so. But I've seen hundreds who are not interested. You know, every day is just kind of day by day. And the, the idea of learning from what I did yesterday or from what I did on last week or the last project. Um, 
years ago, I used to be director of software development for a big multinational nonprofit in Salt Lake City, which is near where I live. And, and I wanted to, to gather that kind of information, you know, about defect rates and stuff, but I, I wanted to do it in a way that could never be punitive, you know, could never punish anybody. And so I, I called an all hands meeting. And I always did this on Friday afternoon, you know, give them the bad news on Friday afternoon. I said, beginning Monday morning, you are to keep track of how many mistakes you make, you know, how many coding mistakes, if you're a coder, or how many testing mistakes, or whatever. And each Friday, there's, there's a little slip of paper, and you're supposed to write name and number of defects this week, and turn it into our secretary, who will gather all that up, and you turn that in on Friday, and on Monday, it will be posted on a big whiteboard, you know, out in the hall. And we're going to rank order them by person who made the most defects last week, and another column, person who made the most defects year to date. Now, you can imagine the reception that I got with this. Oh, first I told them I had good news and bad news. Which do you want first? Somebody said the bad news, and I, I gave them the spiel. Finally, somebody said, all right, what's the good news? And I said, oh, the good news is you cannot use your real name. Each one of you must make up a name known only to you. I am not measuring you. This is not punitive. This is not any attempt to evaluate you. What I'd like you to do is see where you are with relationship to your peers. I'd like you to get a feel for how we are as a group and how you are individually. And they looked at me like, well, what's the, you know, what's the catch? I said, there's no catch. We ran this little experiment for six months, and, and three marvelous things happened. First of all, the air rates went down. And I don't think people were lying to me. There was no reason to lie. I just think that as people thought about it more, because they knew they had to fill out that little form on Friday, they were just more careful. And so everybody's defect rate went down. The second cool thing that happened was that the span went down. That is between the highest and the lowest. You know, the, the people who were making few mistakes made fewer, but the people who were making a lot of mistakes made fewer. And then and I thought those two things were going to happen. I mean, that's why I did this experiment. The third thing, though, was unanticipated. Every once in a while, I'd see these little notes on the, on the whiteboard. Uh, Fuzzy Pickle, meet me at the water fountain at 3 o'clock this afternoon, signed uh, Marshmallow Man. Uh, I encourage people to come up with really goofy names here. And if you looked, you would see that the person requesting the meeting was high on the defect list, and the person being requested was lower down. People were basically getting together and saying, what do you know that I don't know? What techniques do you know that I don't? What are you doing that I'm not doing? And people started to help each other. Uh, it got so prevalent that I actually had to put in my day planner, you know, stay away from the water fountain at 3 o'clock. I didn't want to know who these people were. I went really out of my way to not know. So, yeah, I would think that a reasonable developer would want to know this. What about a tester? Would a reasonable tester want, would, would they want to know what kind of defects do I find well? What kind sneak by me? What kind do I just seem to miss all the time? Are, a place, are there places where I tend to over test? Are there places where I tend to under test? It would seem to me that a good tester would want to know those things about their own, their own work. But again, my, my experience, my history, is that a large percentage, 80, 90 percent of people in our business, whether they're project managers or developers or testers or whatever, are simply not interested in feedback that would help them. And I, I just, I think that's a shame. Excellent question. Um, we're out of time? All right. Um, I appreciate being with you. And, uh, Hope this has been useful, helpful, enjoyable, interesting, all those things. Thanks.